Good morning. 837 Attorney General Levin Camacho joins us in the KU Wave News Zoom room. Good morning, AG. Good morning, Chris. Well, wow, there's just a lot of stuff uh, to cover, so like, we'll jump right into it. I want to kind of start uh, with the release you guys sent out yesterday um, about the uh, working with GPD to establish a deadly force uh, policy. And I guess my thought first off was, is, is there was there a policy, such a policy already in place? Or are we modifying one or are we creating one from scratch from the ground up? We're, we're building from scratch, Chris. Okay. And this is, um, you know, as it's come up, um, as we were working with GPD with, with some officer involved incidents, we realized that there was no formal procedures in place in terms of who should be handling these to ensure there's gonna be an independent investigation, what our role would be, what GPD's role would be. And you know, the exciting part about it is uh, we had a meeting with representatives from pretty much all law enforcement agencies in Guam so that you know, if for some reason they're out and they discharge a weapon and someone gets hurt or they drive and they hurt someone, um, they know that the, what steps they would need to take at that point to contact our office and, and GPD. So it was a good start. Um, I think we, we circulated the, the draft with you. It's two pages, pretty straightforward in terms of what will happen, but it goes back to just building trust so the community knows and you guys know, okay, we heard about an officer involved shooting, someone was seriously hurt, AG's office and GPD are the people we need to talk to and find out what the next steps are gonna be in to get updates. So it's, you know, I, I think it's a very good start and we'll, it was well received yesterday. What do you know offhand, AG, about the, like, is there a policy for, like, the escalation of, of force with the officers when they respond to a scene? Well, I, you know, Chris, and this is something that, I mean, we can't ignore nationally. There's a lot of discussions on use of force. We have the Minnesota case. Um, I think North Carolina, Andrew Brown Jr., there, there's something going on. So um, this is a discussion that's happening across the country in AG's offices, in district attorney's offices, and police departments, you know, all around. So... Uh, yesterday, actually, at the conclusion of our meeting, I had a chance to talk to, to Chief Ignacio and a representative, I think Mr. Perez from the probation officer, and they were talking about de-escalation training, in particular when responding to someone who has mental health uh, issues, mm. and just making sure you get someone out there who's a familiar face, and that automatically will help kind of de-escalate. Because a lot of times, I mean, unfortunately, homelessness is, is rising on the island, and you know, you can see just right by driving by, mental health issues are play a, a factor in that. Substance abuse plays a factor in that. Yeah. So you, you want to have a, a response, but you want to have the appropriate response. So you're not automatically going to go in there and escalate the situation, kind of what you're getting at. So there is already some training that, that's going into place. Um, I think it would be a good idea for us to formalize that. Chief Ignacio had, had mentioned that they're already working on, on developing some kind of curriculum and expanding that type of training. But use of force does, there's a spectrum and de-escalation is always part of that. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, one of the issues when you talk about nationally used force with police, one of the issues that consistently comes up is uh, representation, uh, community representation in different police forces, right? So you kind of want the police force to mirror what the community looks like. Are we, are we, I mean, we're not there yet, obviously, right? Because most of the police are tomorrow. And I mean, there's only, I think, a handful of uh, those, of you know, FSM with dissent. And that's the one I'm kind of getting at is, is uh do you think we need to make inroads in terms of like uh i don't know hiring more uh people of fsm descent to kind of represent what's out there in the community i mean you're always going to want diversity of perspective and views right, right. um and, and i will say that policing today is vastly different than when i was growing up and you know i tell our investigators a story of i went i think you know i went to jfk and i'd always come to school like yeah yeah we were in a chase and they pulled us out of the cars and they beat up everyone in the vehicle, right? I mean, we're, we're not at that point anymore, thankfully, but they're just growing up and it was just kind of a normal part of life that there was yeah. going to be a car full of long haired surfer kids that are going to get pulled over and, you know, there's going to be a ruckus, right? Um, but I, I think nowadays you recognize that policing has changed. It's evolving. Um, Chief Ignacio has, has seemed very open to a lot of what we're doing with this independent investigative team, um, de-escalation training, critical response. So diversity, it, it's just, Getting there is the hard part. We can talk about it, but recruiting is always going to be uh, one of GPD's biggest challenges. They've, they've had these cycles coming through. They're doing a good job, but, um, you know, it's, it is something that we have to support our law enforcement, give them the resources, and I know there's a bunch of bills about paying them the right salary to, to have the ability to recruit. So we have officers who represent the diverse community we have here on the island. So, you know, again, I, I know Chief has identified that as an issue, but it's going to start with paying our police officers a fair wage 
Right. Yeah, and I, I know that when we had him on a, a few times back, he had, he did say that he did have one uh, recruit in the cycle who was uh, uh, of FSM descent. He was really proud of it too. It's kind of cool. You know, you mentioned the joint investigation with the uh, with GPD, the AG, and this is in reference to a lot of these things that were coming out on the federal court side about local law enforcement. Is there a status update on that investigation at all? Uh, it, you know, and. It, and we want to be as transparent as we can, but you know there are some things that I can't say because it would potentially jeopardize the, our ongoing investigations. Um, I can tell you that we continue to look into allegations of criminal activity, uh, including some by law enforcement. But uh, until we we file something in a public manner, uh, but that's pretty much all I can say at this point. But we're, we're looking into it, Chris. Ooh, file something in a public manner? You mean like file something with a court or like a press release? Uh, well. Both are options, I, I would say, Chris. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, you'll find out either way when, when, when it gets done. Uh, what about this online gambling uh, thing, AG? So this kind of came out, and then it was, uh, you know, it was here. It started, I think, at the airport, and then we found out, oh, there was some port, and then uh, we found out through the Civil Service Commission and documents that were filed there that, I mean, there were, there were potentially a couple hundred government employees. And then we started hearing the chief had come out and said, oh, the Secret Service contacted me. And we we heard that from, uh, well, the airport had JQ. But have you heard anything else about this? Um, and is your office working on anything with this, this online gambling uh, app? We're aware of the allegations. And, and uh, you know, kind of going back to my earlier comment, we want to make sure that we're not going to make any comments that would jeopardize any investigations locally or federally. So. Uh, I know there have been some statements about the involvement of certain federal law enforcement agencies, and you pointed out there were allegations of gambling both at the port, airport, GPD. So it's it's pretty broad in terms of the agencies, the allegations. I think GPA was also right, another yeah. story came out about that. Right. Um, but we're aware of it. It's just that I'm very limited in terms of what I can say. And again, I would love to tell you everything that I've heard and all the, the gossip, but just based on the role that we play in this, I don't want to do anything or say anything that would... Uh, There'll be a time, Chris. So okay. It's got to be, I know patience is hard, but um, I'm sure that there are, people are looking into it. Um, do you know, though, let me ask you this, and, and not, you know, I want to ask you if you want to gossip, go for it. But uh, <laughs> so at, how does this online gambling app, which is, you know, it's an online gambling app, how does it become something that the federal authorities are looking at? Uh, you know, I, again, I don't want to speculate, Chris, um, so I, I'm not going to answer. I, I have ideas, but I, I, I can't really, um, I, I don't want to guess about what, what, what avenue they're, they're looking into it. But I would say that, you know, we have our local statutes on gambling. Um, again, this is not an issue that's unique to Guam. When you have online websites and there, there's betting because state to state, you're going to have different rules. So the, there'll be some federal statutes that come into play as well. Um, so that might be the angle that they're, they're looking at. But on the, lo the local side, um, you know, we, we do have a prohibition on, on gambling outside of a social setting. Mm. So, and we also have our DOA rules and regs prohibit gambling during work hours. Um, so for both from the administrative and the criminal side, there are penalties. So if you're on your phone, don't, don't well, one, don't be on the internet at, at work. Um, and don't, especially don't be gambling when you're, when you're at work, if you're a government and employee. Right. And that was kind of one of the things is like, were they doing it on the job? But I, I'll, I'll just say, since uh, you're, you don't want to speculate that uh, what I had heard was that it, the reason why the feds are kind of looking at it is because there may have been some winnings that were had that weren't declared or taxes weren't paid or something. I don't know. Uh, oh, I wanted to let's move on from there. AJ, I don't want to make it uncomfortable for you. Uh, the secret service could be watching after all. Uh, um, I'm sure they are. What about this? Uh, so uh, Senator Joanne Brown had uh, written the governor relative to the former CLTC administrator, Jack Hattig. Um, and this is a bunch of stuff that went on there with the land reports. But then the speaker, Theresa Lahi, had forwarded, I believe, uh, Senator Brown's letter to you. And there was something about allegations of forgery against, again, the former CLTC administrator, Jack Hattig. Did you guys get eyes on that? And is that something that's ongoing? We received the speaker's letter, um, which you're correct, it forwarded Senator Brown's letter. Um, and we, you know, I think we've, we've talked about this before. We actually have an assistant attorney general who's assigned mm. to the Tomorrow Land Trust, who I, I think, as you're aware, was actually told them that they, they could not follow through with the recommendation that was being made right. to, to assign or to transfer a lease. So you know, we 
nothing happened. You know, it was kind of caught. Legal counsel did their job. The commission didn't approve the recommendation. Um, we'll look and see what documents were submitted. But you know, forgery is, is a pretty specific crime as defined by the law. Um, and if it was, I mean, if, if there was criminal conduct, we'll look into it and we'll take action. But I, I think when we talk about forgery, it's not just a general, okay, there's forgery here. You know, there are specific elements that you would need to prove for the crime of forgery. Um, and just based on what I'm hearing, again, it sounds like there was a recommendation that was initially made. It was disagreed with by the executive director. Legal counsel didn't agree with the executive director's recommendation and it died at that point. So we'll, we'll see if, the, if there's any paperwork that supports an allegation of forgery. Um, high intensity drug trafficking area designation. Uh, just a little background. We talked about this at the beginning of the show, but uh, I know we'd put in a request under the Cabo administration and then I, I believe it was a request that was also, uh, it might've been the same one, but uh, I know that we were denied maybe in the first year of Lou and Josh, uh, but then you had come on, I wanna say last year and talked about uh, kind of co-joining with Hawaii and the CNMI and putting in a request that way. And then I understand that you have some news about uh, high Yeah, Yeah, we got, I mean, we got some unfortunate news that our, our petition was denied um, and the, there was a shift in, you know, we, we filed under the Trump administration, Trump and Pence, and there was a new director of the Office of National, National Drug Control Policy. So we received word that um, they had denied our request to be designated as a Haida area, joining Hawaii Haida. And, you know, one of the things that I think we, we have to concede is that we focus, meth is the biggest problem facing our island. So most of the data that we put in there was involving meth and the impact that it's had on our community. Um, we've realized through our opioid litigation that we don't have a ton of data on just how extensive the opioid problem is on the island. And nationally, that is the biggest problem facing us outside of Guam and Hawaii, probably. So uh, th there's pro there may have been a shift in resources kind of more towards the opioid epidemic. That's a, a huge problem across the, the contiguous United States, continental United States. So if, if there is silver lining, though, we are in discussions. We're going to try again. You know, we're going to beef up our, our stats on opioids on Guam and um, efforts that we're making here on the island to address the opioid problem and resubmit re with the blessing of Hawaii Haida. So we're going to still be working closely with them. And, you know, Chris, I, I will say, too, the, our petition wasn't granted, but we have a, I would say we have a much stronger working relationship, both with the NMI as well as the Hawaii Haida folks. And those mm -hmm. partnerships go beyond this formal designation, you know, they, they will help us. Um, one of the things for opioid data collection, as an example, they, they do it in Hawaii. So we're able to see, okay, what, what kind of stats are you guys tracking? How are you tracking it? And we're able to learn from them. So there's just a huge resource to have uh, their office assisting us. It's just kind of crazy, AG, because I, I mean, I don't know, does, does like the height of people have rapporteurs that they can send out? Because I mean, living in, in Guam and I mean even in the NMI you're you're right I mean it's just everywhere the math and it's just hard to put together in our heads why the federal government can't see that and we keep getting denied on this designation I, I agree with you Chris and you know it's it's kind of um what, why would it matter what drug it is that's right. ravaging a community yeah. should it matter whether it's opioids or, or, or ice yeah. um, but that's that's the policy direction that's that might be taken um, now. So we, we know what the, the lay of the land is and we know what we need to address, what, what issues we need to address in our petition. And we plan on submitting again, because it, you know, it is gonna be important mm -hmm. to formalize these relationships and to get as, much, as many resources as we can to Guam to, to fight the drug trafficking issues. And well, let's just dovetail off that uh, opioid um, issue and go into the opioid settlement, because I understand you have some new info about that. Yeah, well, and and what what is it? We just talked about meth is the biggest problem, and, and insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting things to be different, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think we we as an office and myself we're open to trying a different approach, and and some of that is just investing in treatment programs and rehabilitation programs, and we were able to secure you know, 200, dollars settlement earlier this year, and we made a commitment that we're going to put that back into treatment and to rehab um, to to put our money where our mouth is, so to speak. So we've provided a breakdown of that. We've been talking with the folks who are on the ground, Guam Behavioral, we've talked to Oasis, we've talked to Lighthouse Recovery to see where there are gaps 
And right now, uh, the intention is we are going to assist in the recruiting and hiring of two staff to support the residential substance abuse treatment program at the Department of Corrections. We're going to work on a preventative educational campaign on drug abuse, substance abuse, and opioids. We're going to put 60,000 into gathering data on how extensive the opioid problem is on Guam and on drugs as a whole. Mm. And we're also going to provide some direct, some funding to direct service providers. And, you know, when you talk to these uh, great folks at Oasis and Lighthouse Recovery, they, they tell you things like getting an ID, and just the Guam ID is an obstacle that mm. folks have to getting a job because you can't get a job unless you have an ID. But the catch 22 is you need ID to get an ID. So, you know, we're, we're working with um, our government of Guam agencies to see what we can do to assist people who are at these direct service providers to get identification so they can apply for jobs, they can apply for programs, and they can get their lives back on track. Um, they also have had a different approach for incentive programs. So we're, we're really excited to see um, this is hopefully the first settlement we're going to get and then to start mapping out any future funds that we do receive through settlement um, or litigation, you know, the best and evidence-based um, programs that we can support from as an office. Are you guys getting any of the uh, American Rescue Plan uh, funds or any other type of big uh, funds coming down from the federal side? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Chris. I, I, I you know, I, I kind of, I hear things going around. I, I know that there was um, our, our child support system is one of the things that we've been pushing for to get updated. We've actually committed about a million dollars. We're hopefully going to move forward with that. But I, I, you know, there hasn't been any commitments or real discussions on how that money would get to our office. Oh, wow, that's surprising. Um, well, you know, I, I think you just gotta you you prepare for the worst and you hope for the best, you know. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue to, to perform our mission. And I think we're doing we've as an office with the budget that we have, you know, we're we're doing pretty okay. Um, and we could do better. And there's a lot always going to be opportunity to improve the services that we have. But I, I think we're all going to recognize that just economically, we're we're not at a point yet where. We're going to have to, it's going to be a, a tough few years, probably, even with the ARP funds coming in, just locally, our economy, right? Is there any uh, update or any information that you can provide, AG, about um, the, uh, this, this, I saw the speaker, did the speaker forward, forward you a request for an opinion on the open government law relative to the meeting that the legislature, the members of the legislature had with the governor? And did you have We received that, okay. yes, yeah. And, you know, I don't, I can just go based off what's reported. And I had a feeling you were going to ask me about this, Chris. So I actually pulled up the statute here. So oh, nice. gonna, you know, under open government, a meeting uh, is defined as the convening of a governing body of a public agency for which a quorum is required in order to make a decision or to deliberate towards a decision on any matter. And, you know, I, I don't know what exactly was discussed, but just based on what's been reported, I, I don't think that the governor meeting with a senator or numerous senators would count as a meeting as defined by the open government law. But, you know, I, I can just say just based on what's been reported, it sound, we'll have to get a little bit more facts for it. But if I meet with a senator that doesn't, I don't have to put out published notice 10 days in advance and then two days before I meet with the senator to talk right. about right. issues affecting our office. Right. Um, so we received it, we're looking at it, but just on, at first blush, it doesn't seem that it would count as a meeting under open government. Right, right. And I mean, I, I would just say that I, I do know that you meet with senators and, you know, people meet with people, but uh, even at its heart, if it wasn't, uh, you know, a violation of the open government law, I think people just would have appreciated, uh, you know, being able to watch the meeting and to see that interaction uh, between the governor and, and the senators, because that's not something you see every day or, you know, hardly any day, actually. I, I agree, Chris, and I, I, you know, it's one of those things where is it best practice? You guys would say no. Um, yeah. Is it illegal? And that's kind of the question that we've been asked, right, whether it's a violation. Right. So whether it would have been a better idea to invite the media to, to witness this meeting and to talk about the priorities, we'll, we'll leave that up to the legislature and the governor to decide. But, you know, the question we've been asked is whether or not any, any laws were violated. And at this point, we, based on what's reported, I just don't see it. Uh, a few big cases. Um... Over the last uh, couple of weeks, you had the Tuck uh, trial, didn't get the W in that one, uh, the Vargas uh, trial. Just some of your takeaways from those two, AG? You know, uh, our, our prosecutors are, are there to, to promote justice, not to get convictions. And I, I know it's, I, I think this is just a reminder that 
we, we have a very high burden in any criminal case of proving our, our charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so I, I, it's tough. Um, we, as an office, we're going to continue to take the hard cases to trial. I mean, I think we've had, we're in May now, we've had, basically we've been in a sexual assault trial almost every week since the start of the year. And I know just psychologically for our prosecutors, it's been tough. Um, it does weigh on them because these, these victims have kind of entrusted with them to let them present their story. But, you know, Chris, it's just a reminder that it's not easy to get a conviction. You know, it's not, oh, I think that this might have happened or I think that might have happened. We have to prove our cases beyond a reasonable doubt. So when, when you see cases that get resolved via plea agreement, what you guys aren't seeing are victims who are hesitant to come forward, who are reluctant to face their um, the person who assaulted them. Unfortunately, a lot of times these crimes involve people who are known to the victim and the victim's family, and then you have familial pressure to not cooperate. So there's just a lot of things in there. I, I give you know, kudos to our prosecutors, to our advocates. Um, we've actually flown in five or six witnesses throughout this this year alone to come in, including victims, um, because our, our position's been, we're gonna find the money to bring victims in to have their day in court, whether we win or not, or whether we get the conviction or not. That's just a, a policy choice that we've made, but our advocates not only having to provide comfort to them, but to serve as travel agent and try to book we had quarantine at the time as well, so they're navigating that with public health, getting PCR tests. So we've been busy, um, but yeah, I, I think just as it's a good reminder that it's not easy to prosecute, especially when, it, unfortunately, I want to I want to use the word patriarchy, but you know we have a lot of folks who still think, oh, the, the woman deserved it, or she was dressed that way, or she was out there drinking, and you know that's. That's unfortunate, but it's a, a prejudice that we have to overcome on, when we're prosecuting some of these cases, victim shaming. Um, so we have a long way to go as a community, but I, I'm proud of our team to really take these things to trial and, and again, to let the victims have the day in court. What did you make uh, of that, that with the Tuck verdict, uh, AG, that they were in and out, the jury was in and out uh, so fast? And I, I kind of felt like this was a case that could have been ripped from the national headlines and you, you bring up issues of the victim shaming i mean the, the you know the um uh well the, the victim was you know an exotic dancer right and so you had all these different elements of this case that i felt just made it so interesting and i mean everybody was talking about uh this case so was that was that verdict for you and i think i saw something with canto in another media where she had said just because it was not guilty doesn't mean that um he didn't do it so this was like you right. said, one of these cases where you had all these elements of, um, well, I mean, it was basically came down to he said, she said because of, you know, the evidence or the lack of it. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm not going to comment on any particular cases, Chris, and we have to respect, we may not agree with the jury's findings, but we have to respect them and just kind of move on from it. But, you know, I, I do think whether it was that case, just in general, um, I've seen other media outlets in particular that have, have taken a, a position on, on, I mean, I don't want to say victim shaming, but taking some pretty bizarre stances on, on victims and defendants who are convicted, you know, and, and I think it puts our prosecutors in a, I share their frustrations. Like you get mad when there's a plea and then you get mad when there's a not guilty verdict <laughs> and you get mad when we get a conviction and people go to jail for a long time. Yeah. So, you know, justice is, is going to mean something different to everyone. Um, and it goes back to, we're not there to sometimes justice is, allowing a victim to say their piece and to go to court and to know that someone's willing to come to bat for them. And, and again, that's something that we want to really embody as an office. It doesn't matter you know, who you are or what your background is or what your occupation is. If you come to our office or you go to GPD and you report a crime, they're going to take the report and we're going to prosecute it. And it may not, we can't control the outcome, um, but we can ensure that the process is going to be available to those who feel disempowered because that's, that's the way you're going to get more people coming forward. Uh, last question, AG, unless you had something else. I wanted to update on uh, medical examiner. I haven't heard anything about that in a while. Ah, oh, Chris, you know, this is going to be a... <laughs> we, we, we do we, do we just copy-paste your answer from the last interview? Or yeah, what? I mean, we're, we're trying to recruit. I will tell you that um, this is something that our, our National Association of AGs is actually now looking into because it's, it's an issue... The shortage of medical examiners is, is something that's being felt across uh, all states. And I think in Puerto Rico, that's where it started, this, this new project, because they had no one there to help after the hurricane. And they had all these 
bodies basically without any medical examiner to, to work through it. So we're going to continue to recruit. Hopefully we get a qualified applicant, um, but it's, it's, it's been a challenge. I, I can say the, the contractor, the con the doctors we have on contract have done well. My understanding is at trial, they, they performed extremely well. Um, but the ideal situation would be to have someone here in Guam. Right on. Well, AG, thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I'll see you. Right on.